Welcome to this edition of IBFD's Tax Takes News and Views, bringing you the week's tax news in a nutshell. I'm Barry Larking, Special Counsel at IBFD, and with me for our Beyond the News interview is Stuart Gibson, IBFD's Chief Editor, Global News in Washington, D.C. On today's show, Colombia's Supreme Court blocks COVID relief, while Guernsey, Australia and Vietnam step up their efforts. Canada targets online platforms, while Estonia takes a step back and Gibraltar starts losing its EU tax benefits. These are more coming up on IBFD's tax takes, including Stuart Gibson's interview with economist Michael Devereaux. Among other things, Michael serves as the director of the Oxford University Centre for Business Taxation and has long advocated a different approach to global tax reform. First, we turn to the top news of the past week, as reported in IBFT's tax news service. While the rest of the world relaxes rules and regulations to address the COVID crisis, Colombia appears to be doing exactly the opposite, as that country's Supreme Court has struck down yet another tax relief measure as unconstitutional. While the court's earlier decision struck down local tax relief measures, this time the court targeted registration requirements for foreign taxpayers. On the flip side, Guernsey, Australia and Vietnam are some of the many countries that continue to expand COVID-related tax relief. Guernsey has relaxed the requirement for companies to be locally managed, where travel disruption prevents that. This follows similar moves by other jurisdictions that have economic substance requirements. Australia is making full capital expensing more widely available, with a view to creating more jobs and a more robust economic recovery. And Vietnam's latest relief measure will give companies a tax deduction for donations to support COVID-related health activities. Online platforms are in the news this week, with the Canadian government planning to extend its sales tax rules to non-resident sellers and the online marketplaces they sell through. The proposals are targeted at sales of digital goods and services to Canadian consumers and would kick in in mid-2021. Meanwhile, the EU has announced that it has finished fine-tuning its new rules for online platform tax reporting. The idea is that online platforms would report information like sales income and the identity of EU-based sellers to a single EU tax administration, which would then pass the information on to the member states where the sellers are based. Although the EU will likely adopt the directive in the next few weeks, the system will now not take effect until 2023, giving businesses more time to prepare than originally planned. As we reported a couple of weeks back, Estonia was already set to introduce similar rules next year, but the Estonian parliament has just rejected those proposals. Perhaps they didn't want to get too far ahead of the game on this. It looks like the current VAT exemption for financial services may have reached its sell-by date, as EU finance ministers approved plans to update the rules to level the playing field both within and outside the EU. At the same time, the ministers approved various items on the EU tax agenda for the coming years, including plans to work on a digital levy, possibly as a plan B in case no consensus is reached at global level, or perhaps even as an additional measure. The levy would kick in by 2023. The meeting also addressed plans to expand the code of conduct rules that limit EU member states' freedom to introduce preferential tax measures. But ministers only committed to discussing this idea at some time during the upcoming year, This may reflect a wait-and-see policy as regards the ongoing discussions for a minimum global tax. Ministers also expressed support for enhancing the EU's blacklisting initiative. That presumably means that work will continue on expanding the geographical scope of the blacklist and the blacklisting criteria. The European Commission may be headed for another state aid victory in its campaign to end preferential tax breaks. This time, the target is Belgium's practice of making downward profit adjustments under its so-called excess excess profits tax regime. Advocate General Cocotte has just advised the European Court of Justice that the Belgian practice constituted a state aid scheme, as the European Commission claims. But even if the European Court agrees, the Commission still has a long way to go because the courts have yet to address whether the state aid provided under the scheme was illegal. And now moving on to other news. Luxembourg has said it will not grant withholding tax exemptions for dividends paid to Gibraltar resident companies. 
This is a direct response to a recent European court decision that Gibraltar companies do not qualify for benefits under the EU parent subsidiary directive. Other EU member states may well follow. Turkey recently spelled out the details of its new voluntary disclosure plan. Under the plan, Turkish taxpayers will have until end of June next year to disclose undeclared assets. Taxpayers must then transfer disclosed foreign assets back to Turkey within the next three months. And finally, as part of its economic stimulus package, Dubai has announced an 80% discount on fines for customs violations committed before April this year, which just goes to show how fast some governments will go to kickstart their economies. Now we go beyond the news for Stuart Gibson's interview with Michael Devereux. Stuart. Thank you, Barry, for your informative news report. I'm Stuart Gibson, Chief Editor of Global News here at IBFD. I'm joined today by Michael Devereux, Professor of Business Taxation at the Said Business School at Oxford, Director of the Oxford University Center for Business Taxation, Research Director of the European Tax Policy Forum, and other things, quite a portfolio. Welcome, welcome uh, today, Michael. Thank you, pleased to be here. Uh, so much of the international tax community is focused on the OECD's BEPS project. Begun in 2013 at the request of the G20 countries, the OECD has tackled perhaps the greatest challenge in modern international taxation, limiting base erosion and profit shifting in order to produce a more equitable system for taxing authorities and provide greater taxing certainty to businesses. Five years ago, they released final reports on the 15 original action items, having since received buy-in from 137 countries in the BEPS inclusive framework. It seems from the current discussions that the project may have strayed from its original intent to reduce profit shifting. Would you agree with that assessment? And if so, how has it changed? Yes, I, th I think I would agree with that assessment, although you actually framed it rather broadly. So I think if we go back to the original 2013-2015 BEPS project, it was about combating profit shifting and tax avoidance. And it was moderately successful in doing that. Um, and I think one, one feature of that is that this was something which, you know, the OECD members were trying to prevent profit shifting tax havens. I think if we look at what the inclusive framework is now doing, it's really moved on in, in two directions. So first, first for pillar two, uh, I think there was a tension between whether it was really focusing on profit shifting or tax competition. And uh, certainly at times over the last year or two, there's really been an emphasis on tax competition and trying to prevent tax rates going too low. I think the, the latest version of Pillar 2 uh, with a substance-based carve-out actually moves it more back towards the profit shifting issue. I think Pillar 1, however, has little to do with profit shifting. Um, I, I think I really see that as changing the allocation of taxing rights between countries. And I think we start off with governments identifying that digital companies are making large and related to the fact that they have users in their countries. Uh, and that gives them opportunity I don't think that's that's really about profit shifting at all. It can't be down to profit shifting because, uh, you know, those companies were never taxed in the in where the, in the place where they had users. So I think this is a much more difficult battle, if you like. This is really a battle over the allocation of revenue and the allocation of taxing rights, and that's much more difficult to agree on. So you so it sounds to me like uh, in seeking to tackle uh, base erosion, erosion and profit shifting, the OECD has kind of strayed, uh, and I and I get that. Uh, so for a number of years now, you and some of your colleagues in economics and tax policy, and I'm going to name some of them, Alan Auerbach, Michael Keane, Paul Osterhaus, Wolfgang Schoen, and John Bella, to name a few, you all have advocated for a different approach to taxing corporate, corporate profits. And you may disagree, but I'm going to kind of refer to you as BEPS project contrarians. Uh, could you share with us how you and your colleagues have approached the issue and give us your thoughts on how tax policymakers might approach the current challenges differently than in the current BEPS framework? Okay, well, let me first say, I don't think I'm really a BEPS project contrarian. I do see a problem with the existing system in which effectively multinational companies are asked to decide how aggressively they want to shift profits, how effectively how aggressively they want to uh, you know, avoid paying taxes. Um, and I think you know, the 2015 proposals did make some headway in dealing with that. 
But I think the kind of fundamental problems of the system are really kind of much deeper than that. You know, what area should we use to judge whether this is a good tax system or not? And we come up with five. They're not, I don't think they're particularly controversial. They're, you know, is it economic efficiency, fairness, robustness to avoidance, kind of relatively low cost of implementation. It's always going to be high cost given what we're trying to do. And we add on to that stability in the sense that there's no country who's trying to undermine the others. So, that, so that's our starting point. And then we ask the question, you know, how well does the existing system do under those criteria? And our, you know, our basic answer to that is pretty badly on pretty much all of the criteria. So it's not just a, I think this is important, it's not just a problem of avoidance, it's a problem across the board. So you know, it distorts economic choices, it's not robust to avoidance, it's mind bogglingly complex and it creates uncertainty, which creates more economic efficiency itself and you know, higher costs of collecting the tax. And, and, and this stability is undermined by competition between governments. So I, th I think, you know, having got to there, we say, well, okay, let's think more fundamentally about what is it that's creating these problems within the tax system. And I think the answer is the allocation of taxing rights as it currently stands, which is you know, very, very broadly, you know, to try and tax where functions and activities are. Um, and I think in our view, what we need to do is kind of think more deeply about that and say, well, is there, can we think about an allocation of taxing rights which wouldn't have these problems in the same way? Um, and I think our, our answer to that, or kind of the key to the answer to that, is thinking about mobility of whatever it is that the tax system is basing on. If it's basing on kind of where you own intangible assets, that's relatively easily moved. Well, we say, let's think about something which is relatively immobile. And the thing we, we then focus on is actually where your consumers or where your customs are. Uh, and, it, and that's actually a bit like digital services taxes and, and pillar one in the sense, you know, what is it that's relatively immobile? Well, your customers in many cases are going to be relatively immobile. So what we do in the book, we kind of work through all that. And then we think of, you know, we work on two specific proposals, you know, in some detail, which move the system, you know, more towards taxing in the market country like pillar one. Uh, or what we call the destination country. So these proposals have been out for a couple of years, and I think you know the one of our proposals is a kind of relatively modest reforms, at least relatively modest in our view, but it's it's a bit it's along the lines of pillar one and splits up residual profit from routine profit. And the other is a kind of much more radical reform, which we call the destination-based cash flow tax. Now, uh, just so we know, can you share with us the name of the book and tell us when it's coming out? <laughs> The book is, thank you very much, the book is called Taxing Profit in a Global Economy. It's also by the people you've just mentioned, and it should be out by the end of January of next year, so one month, about a month's time. So perfect timing before the G20 finance ministers meeting in February. I'm sure they'll all be reading it avidly. <laughs> so the destination-based cash flow tax was actually, uh, a form of that was introduced in the U.S. Congress uh, uh, I want to say about uh, five years ago. Um, yeah, that's right. Or did you have any hand in uh, in that, or were you asked to opine about that at all? Um, I'm not specifically in the way that they formulated the the proposal, but I've been writing about this for years, so I think you know the the kind of ideas in, in the academic world are, have been out there, and and they certainly drew on some of those. So clearly, there's a kind of huge debate in the U.S. about the about that proposal, which we call the destination-based cash flow tax in 2016 and 2017, and, and the US eventually decided not to get, move in that direction, or at least not completely in that direction. Well, let me ask you this. I mean, it sounds to me like you may be ahead of your time. Do you think the timing might be right now for uh, the OECD to consider that kind of approach? Uh, and I'm going to set this up in context, because last week I asked Bob Stack this question about what happens if you can't reach consensus, and he said, well, I think we should get everybody in a room. And if we have to think about doing this in a very different way, I think that that should be on the table, basically. So do you think that this notion of either a destination-based cash flow tax or some iteration of that might be something that the OECD should be considering uh, as we enter 2021? I, well, I, obviously, I think they should be considering it. I don't expect it to happen very soon because these are kind of radical, these would be radical reforms. I think there's there's something fundamental about this where the you know, there are powerful economic forces pushing us in that direction. Now, if we think of what's happened to statutory rates over the last 30 years, they've been pushed down as a process of competition. And that's because governments have been competing for inward investment as well as revenue. 
So the, the kind of interesting thing about taxing in the market country is that that competition tends to disappear. Uh, so if we look at like rates of VAT, rates of sales taxes, we don't see the same level of competition for those. And this is what we mean by kind of stability and undermining the system. Um, so in a, I think there's a very real economic processes which are driving down taxes by processes of competition between governments on source-based tax, if you like, where functional activities take place. And they have to be, those taxes have to be replaced by something which is not going to move away when you try and tax it. And that's, you know, ultimately people. Uh, and, you know, one way of thinking about that is to tax consumers and customers, or, or rather to tax profits in the place where the customers are. As, as somebody that we both know once said to me, because nobody is going to move to buy a pen. Exactly. Or they, well, they might not. They might move to um, buy something a bit more expensive. <laughs> and that, you know, that creates some kind of issues at the margin. But very broadly, you know, consumers are, are very much more immobile than the things we try and base the tax system on at the moment. Well, much food for thought, and I commend uh, the public to your book because these are issues that you've been talking about for quite a while, and it may be that uh, that your timing is perfect for the moment uh, with uh, where the OECD is now. Our guest today has been Michael Devereaux, Director of the Oxford University Center for Business Taxation and Research Director of the European Tax Policy Forum. Thank you so much for sharing your time and your insights. Much food for thought today, Michael. Okay, thank you for having me. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to promote the book as well. <laughs> that wraps up this week's edition of Tax Takes News and Views, the week's tax news in a nutshell. From Barry Larkin and myself, thank you for watching. Here's hoping your week is not too taxing.